Damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 367. We are into March of 2024 now. We're on the road to WrestleMania. We're on the road after Revolution. Revolutionary Road. That's a book, I think. Anyway, uh, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. Uh, as we mentioned, the Revolutionary Road is over. You went to Revolution, Sting's retirement match. How was it? Uh, sort of the tale of two shows. <laughs> uh, overall, uh, you know, historic night. Some really good wrestling on the show. Happy I went. Big picture. Uh, tell you what, when it was 10.30 p.m. and bald revival and moxley were in there exchanging holds i was like those last couple matches better deliver but they did and uh therefore it was worth it but um yeah it was uh it was a long show stop me if you've heard this before this aw pay-per-view was really long um but it had some really good stuff on it and uh yeah it was it was about a six hour drive for me both ways uh a drive that i did i so we drove in on uh sunday uh started in maryland on sunday morning got in got in around like four o'clock and had a couple hours to putter around ubered to the building so we didn't have to fight parking um which was expensive but the best possible decision we could have made based on how much of a nightmare it looked like getting out of uh, the parking lots was going to be. Um, and then uh, turned around, drove back, you know, eight 30 the next morning. So uh, a lot of time in a car more spent more time in a car than I did, you know, watching wrestling <laughs> or doing the fun thing I was there to do. But uh, yeah, it was uh it was a it was an experience, and like I said, the last the last two of the last three matches uh, were like all time great, and I can't believe I was in the building for great to me. So that probably makes it worth it on its own. Uh, how was the Uber wait leaving the building? Shockingly short. Good. I don't know if it was just like there's a lot of people that drove in for the show. And so everybody was driving their own cars or what, but it was literally as, you know, Sting is saying, thank you. Good night. And walking up the ramp to, uh, to greet people. I pull out the app and I click on it and it says like nine minute wait. I'm like, all right. So I click the button. We make our way out of the arena. We had to, where we exited the building, we kind of had to walk all the way around the building outside. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it was maybe another five, 10 minutes and the guy was there and, we, our hotel was pretty close to the uh, to the arena, so it didn't take us long to get back. Um, and then in a real, really felt like we were living the pro wrestler life because uh, we hadn't eaten dinner. And so we're like, what is open at 1 a.m. in Greensboro, North Carolina? It turns out a lot of stuff. That's um, good. Uh, I mean, it's all fast food. It's nothing, nothing good for you. But uh, a lot of a lot of fast food options, so we uh, were able to door dash something to our hotel and and uh, and uh, not go to bed hungry, um, which it appeared we were going to at one point because uh, the bar and restaurants were all closed in the hotel and uh, the vending machines were broken. So we were uh, we we're kind of looking at our last hope, and we were desperately trying to avoid actually having to go get in our car and drive anywhere. So. Um, it all it all worked out, but yeah, got what wasn't probably didn't go to sleep till about two, and then w was leaving by as I said about eight thirty Monday morning. So it was a uh, it was an experience, and uh, as I said last week, I wouldn't do this for just anyone. <laughs> so, should do it for Steve Borden and his large adult son. That's right. <laughs> got riled up by the good word of the Lord. <laughs> That was uh that was a choice, having uh Sting's sons dress up as other versions of Sting. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I all all I, the only thing mildly negative I'll say is that about Sting is this. It's like, are we sure he cares? <laughs> does he does he care that his sons like went through six months of uh, intense uh, bodybuilding training and uh, bleached their hair and that sixteen thousand people packed a building to say goodbye to him and does he care? <laughs> you know, we talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago. I think. Probably for good reason. Sting has had a very aloof <laughs> nature, pub- public facing nature, I would say. Yeah. For, you know, for most of his career. And, you know, there was a lot of, you know, I know his sons both did like little testimonials. I think there was that Players Tribune thing where a bunch of people left voicemails for him and they talked about how, you know, you're always there for me and we're so proud of you. So, uh, you know, I hope, I hope he's, if he's not able to really maybe if you were if you were wanting the Ric Flair, Shawn Michaels openly weeping in the ring, I don't think we're ever getting that from Steve, <laughs> um, which I'm not saying I'm, which isn't a bad thing or a good thing. It's it's neither good nor bad. It's just different. Um, but it's uh, I don't I don't think we're ever going to see that level of emotion from him. Uh, I mean, when he when he did his I, it felt more sincere than like. His WWE Hall of Fame speech, if that means anything. <laughs> sure. Uh, but no, I don't ne- I don't necessarily know that I maybe he would say this is one of the best nights of his professional career, but I don't right. ne- I don't necessarily know that he would if this is like the best, if this is gonna be the best day of Steve Warden's year <laughs> <laughs> as a whole. Because you know, he's probably working on some very expensive <laughs> properties in Malibu right now that he's <laughs> looking on load and so i'm sure that's uh you know his true passion has always been real estate we all we all know this he always treated pro wrestling like a job Mm -hmm. and it's just it's exceedingly rare in this generation yes (laughs) and uh he's someone that wasn't corrupted by the business in the previous generation or two that he was part of Mm -hmm. which is also exceedingly rare it's just it's so different (laughs) where this isn't his be all and end all. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's it. Right. It's like you get the ceiling that yes, flair always needed the money (laughs) when flair made any of his numerous comebacks. True. But also what else is Ric Flair going to do? (laughs) Somewhat similar to Hulk Hogan. Like, there is no other world where that person makes sense. <laughs> you can try to put them on American Gladiators or a reality show or whatever, or have them, you know, appear in the background of rap videos or whatever. It's like, no, they only really make sense in a context where they're in a pro wrestling ring trying to get you to care about them having a wrestling match. Like it's just some guys will some guys are like that. And I think for Sting. I think you're right. Like he treated it like a business, but in a different way than like Kevin Nash treated it like it was a business. <laughs> like Kevin Nash, that's you know famously how what he always describes it as. He was in there to get money for him and his friends, and and that was all there was to it. And he made a lot of money doing that. Whereas Sting, Sting managed to treat wrestling like a business uh, throughout his entire career, especially from like, you know, whatever, 99 on whenever, whenever he, I guess maybe 98 on whatever, he really stopped caring (laughs) and then, you know, managed to get himself paid by TNA for 12 years. And he did a lot of really good stuff at TNA. It's not as if his body of work wasn't good in some of the places he worked, even when he was looking a little checked out at times, but yes, he, he managed to treat wrestling like a business. Like it's not the only thing in the world that makes sense to him. And also he managed to do it in a way where everybody who meets him and who worked with him is like, what a cool guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, like I said, I, I don't mean this in in any way as a knock on him. Oh yeah. <laughs> but he's, he's one of one. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So that's cool. Um, the match itself, his retirement match it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to watch on TV, um, except when uh, I thought Darby Allen had passed away. <laughs> oh, uh, once Dar- again, you and I have very different. 
Oh, I was you, laughing. <laughs> you enjoyed that? <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Um, I mean, I, like, like, an, after the initial like ten seconds where like you could see he was breathing, I was like, "All right, we're good. It's okay to think <laughs> this is funny now." <laughs> um, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate anyone to do it, but he took a swan. T- he took a swan on off the ladder through panes of uh some kind of treated glass. Yeah. Cut his back all up, um, but still came back for the finish of the match and everything. So it's it's Darby, and then he's going to go climb Mount Everest next week. So, uh, he's uh, he's a very stupid human being. Yeah. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not advocating or saying anyone should do that. But yeah, I I was that I was very entertained by him doing it. <laughs> Oh, it was a spectacle. Again, I'm not I'm not saying that this is uh I mean it definitely got the reaction that he was looking for. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that's mm-hmm. the only point where I wasn't just having a blast watching this. Fair because, enough. Because the young bucks ping ponged around for Sting and um were taking three stooges bumps <laughs> and some of the uh the no selling that Sting was Sting would kick out, they would hit Sting with everything in the world, and Sting would kick out progressively quicker after everything they hit him with Mm -hmm. which was a tremendous story but also very very funny absolutely (laughs) and uh it was a blast except for when i thought darby allen had died (laughs) yeah that's fair (laughs) i think that's a very natural reaction to have for the record (laughs) i i yours is laughter i'm i'm the outlier i think here i don't i don't think i'm the normal one here (laughs) like it was one thing it was like well i knew he survived the fall but then he began bleeding out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, there was a moment there when they showed, like, on the Tron, they're, I guess, showing the TV feed, and you see that, and you go, oh, they they might they might need to get him out of here. <laughs> like, they might, this might be staying in a handicap match for the rest of this. Very much so. Maybe it was more clear on television than in the building that this was life and death. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, again, they showed like a couple shots on the Tron where you could see he was bleeding pretty heavily. So I like guess, yeah, I don't know. My reaction was just like, oh, what a big dumb idiot. But <laughs> he is sacrificing, sacrificing for this business. Capital T, capital B. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't think Rick Flair needed to be there. Nope. Never thought he did. How does he feel? How do you think he felt when Ricky Steamboat got like 10 times the reaction he got? <laughs> Um, I don't think Rick cares either at this point, as long as the check clears. Fair. Um, I mean, he definitely does want to be loved in life, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, his he mostly cares about the money. It goes uh, money, delicious <laughs> alcohol, <laughs> uh, his his wife that isn't actually his wife, right? Her children. Yep. His yep. daughter. His, his dead son. Yes. 50 feet of shit. His other son that's still alive that he doesn't his, speak to, I'm pretty his sure. Li- his, li- his, li- his other alive daughter. Oh, that's right. There's another alive daughter. 50 right. more feet. And then... And then and then David. David Flair. Yes, that's right. Well, the Young Bucks, uh, like I said, I thought they were fantastic in this match. I hate the characters. The characters are stupid. Um, but... They were fine stooges in this match. And um, yep, that's all I have to say about that. Anything else you want to talk about uh, as far as that match goes? No, I think that was they they redid the spot from the Forbidden Door match, which was is like my favorite spot in the a double su- history. The double super kick beat his ch- sting beats his yeah. chest spot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's the. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, and and then he hits the big double close line, and they flip. They do. They somehow like flip twice in the air, seemingly. <laughs> yeah, off, off of his clothes lines. It's, yeah, that was them redoing that made me very happy. And uh, and yeah, just just being in the building for that and that atmosphere and the post match, which to my understanding was cut off uh, mid sentence on the pay per view. Although I know it was put online pretty quickly afterwards, but. Yeah. Um, that was nice. That was nice too. You know, he talked about again, he didn't sting is also a guy who I feel like he's not a guy who changes the story just cause he's told it already. 
Right. So like after the show's over, he's talking about the 45 minute draw with Ric Flair and he's talking about Darby's his favorite tag team partner he's ever had. And what a blessing he's been to him. And yeah. You know, and how, how much history he has in, in Greensboro and how proud he is to end his career. Like it's every, it's everything he's already said in, uh, you know, in interviews leading up to the show or things, if you've ever heard one of his, if you saw the WWE documentaries they did about Sting or any podcasts he's appeared on, like it's, it's pretty much, he has his pat answers and his pat references that he, uh, that he makes. And so it wasn't, again, you weren't getting a lot of uh, new material, so to speak, but it was nice. And it, he seemed genuinely not aware that the whole roster was going to come out and applaud him at the end. Of course, did you notice that Dax Harwood was had to be in front and be the first guy to hug Sting when he got up to, to the stage? I did not. He no. loves Sting the most. It, <laughs> this affected him the most. So it was important he, that he was in the front. He loves this business the most. Yeah. Well, also, you know, short guy, you know, if he stood in the back, he couldn't see. So um, <laughs> I understand it. Uh, that's fine. But uh, yeah, it was it was the the post match and they, you know, they shoot off the confetti and everything was was very cool. It was a it felt like a piece of history. It felt like one of those if the company closed down the day after that show, well, it probably wasn't going to get any better than that anyway, you know? Sure. And uh, yeah, they did that. They did that right. They treated Sting correctly. Mm -hmm. They used him properly. They, you can, I can say a lot of bad things about Tony Khan. I can't say, I I can't say a bad thing. Well, I'm not going to say any more bad things until uh, after, since uh, they've issued me media credentials for next week. But uh, (laughs) we'll check back after that show. Uh, No, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, he uh, he did everything with Sting uh, correctly, so I got no problem with, except getting his uh, getting his farewell speech on the air <laughs> <laughs> because uh, they had to do so much wrestling on this uh, on this show. These shows don't need to be five and a half hours. I'm sorry, they just don't. And then yeah. we don't need to, we don't need to talk about them for two hours afterwards. Yeah, I don't uh, like I say being in the building. Up until the Osprey match, uh, it was nothing on the show. I thought was I could think of was bad. I didn't enjoy the first ten or so minutes of the FTR uh, Blackpool Combat Club match, um, but I thought even that got good by the end. So it's nothing. Nothing in a bubble was bad, but it was. You have been sitting there. <laughs> for three hours, three and a half hours, four hours. And there's still, and then you go, Oh, I forgot this match is on this show too. That happened to me like three times. Uh, I was like, Oh, oh, right. This is on the show again. No, no offense to anyone in particular, but it's just one of the things where it's like, Hey man, maybe you could do like two fewer matches or you could give everyone about six fewer minutes. (laughs) I mean, I don't think they could afford to cut six minutes off the women's match, but they could have cut, time here and there on several of these matches and 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 or done a few less matches and it would have been okay um it would the world would have kept spinning but that's again feels like something from a bygone era of wrestling and we got to get everybody on the show and we talked about this a little bit off the air there i'm sure there is a mentality to an extent of you're asking people to still pay fifty dollars per show uh, for these pay-per-views. So you want to like make sure it's overstuffed and you're everybody that can possibly be on the show that someone might buy the show to see is on. So that's why you got to find a place for Jericho and find a place for you know, whoever else FTR and John Moxley and whoever. I'm, I'm done finding places for Chris Jericho. Uh... Oh, I, <laughs> I don't I don't agree with that mentality just to be, to be clear. I just I just think that's what the mentality is on perhaps on the company's part. I I agree I agree with you. We talked about this off the air in that we th- I think Tony Khan's philosophy on these shows comes from a good place. And like he's trying to be good to his talent and make sure that everybody's happy and get them get as many of them on the show as he can. And I think he's trying to give the fans more than their money's worth. Mm-hmm. Which is a wonderful, uh, 
a wonderful attitude to have for a wrestling promoter and exceedingly rare. However, when you're producing as much content as he is every single week, you need to get out of that mindset. <laughs> we need to we need to get in and get out. We don't need we don't need a five and a half hour show on a Sunday night. We just don't. Yeah, on a non holiday so. weekend. And again, like you said, it also resulted in Sting's speech being cut off. So if there's one if there's one thing you did want to see go longer, it's the main event. And they were up against a a time crunch and obviously for whatever reason didn't make whatever deal you have to make with various pay-per-view providers to go past the the 12 a.m. mark. So, uh, yeah, you could have just... If you don't want to do that, that's fine. I encourage people to end their shows before midnight. But, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that means you have to do two fewer matches or you need to cut everyone's time by... Or make sure people are sticking to their times if they're... Yeah, and not going over. That's I'm sure that can be a problem as well sometimes, so... Yeah, it's just these the shows would be more enjoyable if if I were if I were a little less exhausted when they were over. But on this particular show, it was the last couple of matches that I thought really are what delivered. So it's it's kind of a weird the the slog felt like the first two hours and then the fun stuff was at the end. So all right. Also on this show, uh Samoa Joe beat uh Hangman and Swerve to retain the AEW world title in a three way. They did the finish of what I thought they were going to do where Joe tap or uh, yet yeah, page tapped out. So swerve wouldn't become champion. Uh, Will Ospreay beat Kaneske Takeshita in uh, just an absolute banger. Yeah. Um, the championship match, since you mentioned that first fun, um, it was between the main event and Osprey Takeshita. So they had a tall order ahead of them, but the crowd got really into it and felt like they really wanted to see Swerve win. Um, and then really what got them into it is when Hangman started assaulting referees, um, which I guess is a setup to once again, write him off TV for a time. Um, so but uh, yeah, that's that's the story. There's also the spot in the match, which they replayed on Dynamite Wednesday, where Swerve hits his kick on Joe and Joe is out cold. But instead of covering Joe, he goes and does his kick on Hangman instead and H Hangman kicks out of it. So the the idea that these guys hate each other so much that Joe just was able to kind of squeeze through with the. With the with the win is it was uh, was laid out as again like you said most people expected, um, and then yeah the the Takeshita and Osprey match, I think is the best match I've ever seen live. Um, it's up there certainly. I mean there was there was a the main event of this show is also up there <laughs> as the best match I've ever seen live, um, and obviously has way more historical significance to it. Um, the previous match I probably would have said that about was the Young Bucks and Lucha Bros in a ladder match of All Out 2019 uh, in Chicago. That was obviously a way different type of spectacular than the Osprey Takeshita match, which was just your, you know, your your fighting spirit, crazy move, kick out, uh, you know, incredible different exchanges and counters, everything everything you expect from a Will Osprey cutting edge match when he's in there with somebody that can really go and can kind of match him, uh, you know, move for move and, and can keep up with him on a cardio level. Uh, that's what you got. And uh, it, the crowd was tired before they got in the ring. And that place was in a frenzy by the time Osprey and Takeshita were done. So that was maybe the most impressive part. My, my buddy that I went with even said like, I was pretty worn out. And then that match, I felt like I was good after that match happened. I felt like I was good for the rest of the show. So um, yeah, it felt like they, they had a really special match and they, I, you can't say save the show because people were going to go crazy for sting no matter what, but they kept, kept the energy uh, uh, above a level <laughs> 
that you might expect on a show that was going to midnight. Tony Storm beat Deanna Perrazzo in kind of a nothing match. Mm. And uh, Moxley and Claudio beat FTR in a match that went over 21 minutes. And um, I didn't think it was particularly good. Yeah, I mean, people got really into the near falls at the end. Uh, and when Dax started bleeding and everything, I felt like people woke up a little bit. But there was a lot of uh, just holds being exchanged and grappling and chops. And uh, yeah, I get it. I get why this match was here. I get they were trying to go out and have a, you know, a Southern style tag. You know, Claudio and Mox came out in road warrior pads and uh i don't know if you've heard but ftr are big fans of uh of uh, you know of tully and arn uh so they want they wanted to have an nwa southern style long match with multiple heat you know multiple heat segments multiple cutoffs multiple hot tags and you know a lot of blood and grit and like i said by the end the crowd was into it but that was a it felt long <laughs> and i also did not particularly enjoy it like i said until the last couple of minutes were good i thought but um not every match needs to be 20 plus minutes Roderick strong beat orange cassidy and won the international title wardlow won an all-star scramble match to get a future world title shot he gets that title shot at big business this coming week and Eddie Kingston beat Brian Danielson to retain the Continental Crown. Danielson had to shake Eddie's hand. Christian Cage beat Daniel Garcia to retain the TNT title after, um, I think it was one of the only uh, Barry the Referee finishes on this show. Uh, maybe it was one of two. I can't remember. But uh, it was a classic AEW Barry the Referee finish in that one. And then on the pre-show, Statlander and Willow beat Julia Hart and Sky Blue. And... The Bang Bang Scissor Gang beat uh, Jeff Jarrett's crew. Uh, Anything stand out among all of those for you? Um, I got to see Satnam Singh wrestle, which very upon very happy for you. Upon further reflection, was probably the real highlight of the trip. Um, yeah, Jay White more over than you would expect, based on how he's currently being pushed on television. Um. And other than that, I, I really thought like on a on a technical level, <laughs> the the women's title match was very good, um, but people did not care. And also they didn't want like Tony is the heel, but nobody wants to boo Tony. And I don't think people like dislike Diana, but they don't want to cheer her over Tony. Uh, right. So the crowd was mostly respectfully silent. <laughs> Yes, for that match, and then they do the Gaga at the finish, and Tony just wins. So uh, they did do the spot where Tony taps out behind the ref's back. So maybe they'll do a rematch here if they if they want, but we'll see. Um, how was Eddie and Danielson live? That was good. I really enjoyed that. That was it, it was as advertised. It was it was a lot of chops and. <laughs> and uh and suplexes and uh yeah i thought it was really good they told us the you know eddie hurts his hand chopping the the pole early in the match so he can't hit his he can't hit his back fist he can't throw chops with his dominant hand so he's sort of fighting it's it's it was a good way for him i think to be the underdog while being you know eight inches taller than brian danielson <laughs> it was a good way for brian to kind of maintain the bully status until the end of the match and then ultimately uh eddie eddie conquered and and won anyway so it was it was good um and and a lot of fun and the post match felt uh was good uh i thought i enjoyed i enjoyed that quite a bit it wasn't stellar maybe if if you were expecting this to be like a match of the year candidate it wasn't i didn't think but it was it was enjoyable and it was what you would want these two guys to be doing, which was just chopping and suplexing the hell out of each other. All right. Well, the follow up to this show was the season premiere of AEW Dynamite. New logo, new set. It's going to bump everything up a ratings point. Uh, new logo and new set. 
and uh, ratings were down. Uh, we don't. No ratings talk, though. <laughs> uh, very little ratings talk. Uh, the numbers are going to be what the numbers are. Uh, that That's what. There's such little fluctuation every was, single week. I was going to uh, say, but, this is but, kind of the anomaly week, but it's, yeah, it's. <laughs> it was their lowest total viewership since October. <laughs> Yes, it's been. I feel like they've been sitting at like eight hundred and twelve thousand viewers for like the last twenty three weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the the ten week average is uh, eight hundred twenty five thousand. Okay, so I'm lowballing them a little bit, but a little, but not. I mean, uh, let's see. Uh, eight twenty two, eight twenty eight, eight eleven, eight oh five, eight eighteen, eight thirty seven, eight ninety one, seven ninety seven, eight oh one, eight forty three, and this week seven seventy nine. So that's. 779 and it was the the second lowest in the demo of the last 10 weeks uh yeah uh okada debuted uh the new set did absolutely nothing uh people seem to like it and uh i like bright colors so uh, i have no problem with the new set okada debuted uh so they did not go double debut Mm -hmm. for uh for next week but Okada came in and uh, Tokyo Sports reported that he's making like four and a half million dollars a year, which uh, good for him. Sure. Uh, and uh, I don't really know what to say. Other than they brought him in and they aligned him with the Young Bucks and he's part of the elite and he's going to be doing uh, uh, some wonderful skits and uh, has some fun little sketches. <laughs> And uh, he's part of the uh, the Young Bucks group now. The Young Bucks have fired Kenny Omega from the group because he's out hurt. And they've kicked Hangman out. They suspended Hangman uh, as for storyline cover for whatever's going on in his life that he can't be at TV. So um, Okada is in. Omega and Hanger are out. And... Um, I hope uh, Okada makes this Young Buck young bucks act more palatable for me because i um, it's I don't one <laughs> it's one there's one large logic hole in all of this and it's that tony khan is mentioned every other sentence on commentary it's like why doesn't tony khan who makes matches and signs people and books matches and is always making matches official mm-hmm. why is it why doesn't he tell the young bucks to knock it off Good question. <laughs> it's a very good question uh, that I don't have an answer for. Uh, yeah, no, that's I. I think we we talked about this. I think on last week's show, probably several times. A lot of what they've done, I don't think in a bubble or on paper is bad. Like them throwing their weight around, and because they don't think they can, because they're evps and they got a they signed big new contracts and and they can do whatever they want them you know menacing tony shivani because he's friends with sting sure whatever but yeah the 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 thing where they specifically are flaunting their executive power theoretically is and fighting guys and and all of that is is dumb uh, and then also like attack threatening to beat up announcers and things like that. And the idea that Tony is not stepping in there is good. Now in a vacuum, I will say I did really enjoy them doing their impression of Tony Khan's big announcement <laughs> with like the weird plastered smiles and yes. the very stilted delivery. Yes. That was funny. I thought that was really funny. Um, and O- bringing Kata- Okada in and making him a heel right away is a choice. Um, uh, I don't even necessarily hate that choice, by the way. Yeah, I- it was the- it was what happened in New Japan. He came in and he was rejected, and then eventually he became the biggest baby face in the world. Right. Um, it's all it's a way to one. You need you probably need more heels. You need a you need more top heels right now than you do baby faces. Um. So it's probably a good move, like depth chart wise. Um, and also, obviously, there's the real life story. The Bucks and Okada have been friends for 15 years or whatever, and he got them into New Japan. Now they're bringing him into uh, to AEW. It's good. 
I think the Bucks are also at their best when they are the tag team standing next to the main eventer. <laughs> um, are they're they're good when they have a third guy to play off of. I think that helps their dynamic a lot. Um, yes, that they should either stop doing the thing where they menace people and find people and threaten to fire people, uh, or they should explain why Tony Khan can't simply put a stop to this <laughs> and or why he isn't. Uh, and I don't really know. I can't really think of what a good explanation for why Tony Khan isn't stopping the young bucks from wreaking havoc as EVPs. Uh, like what a good version of what a good answer to keep that storyline going would be. So maybe just knock off that part of it. And just let him act like, you know, goofball pricks. Like <laughs> that sure. would be fine. Sure. Uh, Osprey had another banger in the uh, Dynamite main event against uh, the guy from Aussie Open who likes big butts. Mm -hmm. um, tell you what, so far, uh, just one week of Osprey having matches on AEW TV every week. I don't know if I don't know how long he'll he'll be able to keep this up. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the early returns are strong. Morale is high. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, both matches were awesome. As mentioned, the pay per view match was great, and this match was good. There is something, and I saw someone put up the clip. It's like, look at what Osprey was doing during a commercial, and he's doing like a springboard drop kick to Fletcher, who's like on the ground, and and doing like a tiger driver during the commercial. And he's like, he he's not a uh, he's not grabbing holds during the breaks. <laughs> Uh, he's he's going full bore. He's trying to trying to do the full Will Osprey uh, special, even when they're uh, when they're in picture in picture or in break. So will that last? Who knows? But and I also wonder for the audience or for the live crowd, I should say, will at some point they run into the kind of the same issue they run into with like Moxley and a few other people where the crowds love the entrance, love seeing them, but also at what point do you need to start booking up against guys that people believe might beat him? So obviously we're very early days. So there's a novelty of just seeing him wrestle for a while that you get out of this. But then at some point it's like, and then there's those collision ep uh, episodes where Moxley wrestles Lee Moriarty. And it's not that the match is bad, but nobody believes Moxley's going to win. So the crowd's kind of quiet during most of the time Lee Moriarty's on offense. So that's that's probably the biggest thing they're, they'll have to fight as as Will Ospreay becomes a more common uh, figure on their television is booking him against people that uh, in, are booking him in matches where people think he could actually potentially lose. All righty then. Um, WWE, on the other hand, has uh, made events set for both nights of WrestleMania now. Um I guess they haven't officially made Rock and Roman versus Seth and Cody for night one. I think that'll probably be official on SmackDown this week. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's obviously the match where if uh, the Bloodline win, then it's a uh, no DQ match basically the next night for Cody and Roman. And if uh, Cody and Seth win, then it's uh, the Bloodline are banned from the building for Cody versus Roman, which uh, seems like... That would make the most sense. So, so sorry. So the first, the first thing is if Rock and Roman win, then it's bloodline rules, correct? Right, correct. Okay. Which is loosely defined, but what did I say? It's basically no DQ. Right. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm just okay. That's what they're gonna do then, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. You could do either thing. It's like I, I, because is the Rock if... really not gonna be? at ringside for the real main event on night two. I don't know if, if it were me, I would want the fans to know. All right. He's finishing the story. <laughs> and the way got your, their money in your front pocket. So what, like why <laughs> they've had the money in the front pocket for six months. Sure. This, this show sold out six months ago. Right. Well, <laughs> we don't we need to do anything. <laughs> We talked we about the time to... why it was so weird that Dwayne insisted on working this show and not one where he could take a bit more active credit in drawing the house. Well, all right. 
Um, New Japan has started the New Japan Cup, and uh, the Jungle Boy has joined the House of Torture, and everyone loves it. Yeah, it's all great. <laughs> Everyone's yeah. careers are turning out exactly how they thought they would. Yeah, it's uh, it's going really well. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the new post Okada era in New Japan is definitely off to a uh, to a strong start. I mean, look, they'll they will have uh, you know some shows that have big crowds. Still, <laughs> they drew they're drawing what appears to be a pretty decent house in America. Surprisingly, although they are doing Naito and Moxley in the main event of that show, which is a match they haven't done, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so beyond that, I don't know. That G one's gonna look real bleak this year <laughs> if they do it the way they've been doing it the last couple of years, where there's like the four groups that get whittled down to two groups. Uh, it's gonna be pretty bleak. Yeah, it's not looking good. Uh, WrestleMania has uh, uh, night one. Um, we'll have the uh, the tag matches mentioned. Um, night two, we know we'll have. Seth versus Drew for the World Heavyweight Championship, Roman versus Cody for the uh the big gold belt. Mm-hmm. And uh nights not yet announced. We have Rio versus Becky, as we know, Eo versus Bailey, as we know, and uh Gunther will face the winner of a gauntlet match set for this Monday's Raw. That where uh, all the geeks will wrestle, and then one of those geeks will advance to face Gunther at uh, WrestleMania. And uh, it would seem Sami Zayn would be the favorite to win that. It's a group that includes Bronson Reed, Chad Gable, JD McDonut, uh, Ricochet, and uh, Sami Zayn and Nakamura. And uh, Gable and Sami Zayn are really the only two that have been uh, positioned as a potential winners for it. So I guess we'll see. And uh, Gunther's got to be dropping that title at some point because you would think he's going to be wrestling Cody for the title uh, all summer. So I would think that uh, Gunther has to lose that Intercontinental title sometime. But uh, what do I do? Yeah, but, you know, Vince is probably calling, trying to get him to work. He wants him to work on the B-Towns with Duggan all uh, all yes. summer. And, uh, you know, Cody Cody can work the A-shows against, uh, you know, whoever's left. But, uh, no, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else there is. That's the thing about long title reigns like this, is that there's very few people. I... They haven't done Gunther and Sammy because Sammy wasn't a baby face for a lot of Gunther's run. So they managed to mostly keep them apart for the last year, at least as far as like a big time pay-per-view singles match. So uh, yeah, that would be an all that on paper looks like a really good match and could give Sammy a big singles WrestleMania win after he, you know, was part of the hottest storyline in your company for a while and has been, you know, not not rudderless, but not exactly in a you know a super pushed spot over the last you know six to nine months or so. So this would be a chance to give him a big win, and as you said, kind of reset Gunther to go after the world title. Oh, uh, I guess last thing we have to uh, discuss here today, um, Kevin Kelly, <laughs> Kevin Kelly. <laughs> Has kind of been subtweeting Ian Riccoboni on uh, social media for a couple of months now. Uh, if you'll remember a couple of months ago, uh, AEW or Ian Riccoboni is the regular Ring of Honor commentator and is the fill in commentator uh, on various AEW shows. And uh, Kevin Kelly was hired and debuted as the lead voice for AEW Collision when that show debuted about nine months ago. And um, I will just say, I met Kevin Kelly one time. He was exceedingly nice to me. And uh, even as he was wandering around the WrestleCon Hotel, uh, waiting to be recognized by fans. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Kevin, (laughs) I think Kevin is a very nice man, Mm -hmm. even if he has um, some political views that are a little fringy. Mm. And uh, that um, are are probably not very popular today. Sure. 
uh, Kevin Kelly paints himself as a man who loves the Lord mm-hmm. and uh, pro wrestling. And those things are not always easy to reconcile. But uh, and I think he was he did he was an, an excellent voice for New Japan Pro Wrestling for many Absolutely. years. Absolutely, I will. Whatever you know, I don't even dislike him as an announcer now. <laughs> you know, I I think he's I I can't bring myself to say good, but there was something sort of comforting in the him and Nigel pairing for me. Um, so I don't even hate him now. But yeah, during the 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 height of new japan uh in the in the mid to late 2010s he was incredible and added a whole lot to those shows so yeah i don't i don't think it's fair to critique his entire body of work or we've talked about this before when someone is a bad is maybe a person you don't like in real life or you think they're a bad person maybe they are a bad person we don't know kevin (laughs) personally but Whenever that is, there is usually a rush to also uh, poo-poo their professional uh, when they have, you know, athletes, actors, pro wrestling commentators um, say, well, they were never that good anyway. So us us kicking him to the curb now is no big loss because they weren't very good. I will not say that about Kevin. I thought he was a great, great announcer uh, for for New Japan, especially. And like okay. I said, I still find fi- find him somewhat enjoyable even now on Collision. So then he signs with AEW and he leaves NJPW over a period of months. Mm-hmm. And uh, he becomes a voice of Saturday Collision and fans don't react well to it because he doesn't know the roster. <laughs> he clearly has not done a deep dive on the AEW product. There's a lot of product to do a deep dive on, but uh, it took him more than a couple of uh, shows to get up to speed on New Japan or uh, on AEW rather. Mm -hmm. And then when he did, um, Tony Schiavone goes to Tony Khan and Schiavone's talked about this publicly and says, you know what, Tony, I would like to try uh, doing play by play again. I, um, I think I would be better at it now than I was the last time I gave it a shot. (laughs) And uh, how about you put me on Rampage? And Tony Khan goes, actually, how about I put you on Collision? (laughs) So then this three, the Collision becomes a three man booth with Shivani as kind of play by play guy. Kevin Kelly play by play adjacent. I mean, it's a weird spot for both of those guys to be in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nigel's there doing color still. But uh, Kevin Kelly is is quasi demoted from number one mic to number two and a half mic on collision. (laughs) Anyway, somewhere along the lines here, Ian Riccoboni goes on the Voices of Wrestling Discord (laughs) and buries Kevin Kelly. Oh, yeah. And I... Wish I could remember what the, what was that about? <laughs> uh, I don't remember exactly what set it off. I think it was, I think it was someone he they were on a show in Calgary when I believe Kevin was in Japan doing the G one, and uh, and Ian was wearing a cowboy hat, and I I believe Kevin tweeted something about no other pro wrestling announcer should wear a cowboy hat other than Jim Ross. And I think Ian took exception to that and then began to uh, air some, air some laundry. <laughs> uh, so Rick Boney, right. So Rick Boney goes on with discord and says, um, he's promoting QAnon stuff. Um, he's super right wing. And then he buried me on all of this uh, for wearing a cowboy hat. And um, he's been taking shots at me for six, seven years. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, says that the, Kevin has been very petty to him over the years and always taking shots at him. Anyway, this becomes public because Ian Riccoboni 
doesn't understand that there's no such thing as anything private when it comes to electronic communication. Correct. And anything and everything can and will be screenshotted and uh, whatever, whatever. So then Kevin Kelly starts subtweeting Ian Riccoboni. And uh, then the day before revolution, Kevin decides to go public and starts tweeting about how Ian has libeled him and done damage to his career. And uh, he's considering legal action. <laughs> and, and he does this the day before, like, Collision is on the air. I think Collision was taped. I don't remember. It, yeah, it was taped last week. But Yeah, Collision was taped. It was on the air, or about to go on the air, and he's uh, tweeting about this. And uh, and also and, arguing with people about the, the right-wing Sound of Freedom movie. Right, about whether or not the movie that he plugged during the G1, Sound of Freedom, or whether or not it's a QAnon movie. Mm -hmm. uh so then uh five days later here on thursday of this week chemical is removed from the aw roster page mm -hmm. and um no official word from aw on what happened there but sure seems like uh, that that usually means something like when uh, Mike Santana was removed from the roster page this week and then it was like well Mike Santana is no longer with aew and they have not publicly said, oh, we made a mistake. Or uh, two weeks ago, somebody, they took somebody else off the, the roster page. Yeah. But that was a mistake because then they quickly remedied it. <laughs> it was like, oh, no, we made a mistake. So-and-so is back on the roster page. Uh, Kevin Kelly's gone from the roster page and there's no comment about it. So it sure seems like Kevin Kelly's legendary run <laughs> as the voice of AEW Collision uh, could be coming to an end. We'll see what he can do about uh, suing uh, Ian Riccoboni if that's sure if that's where that goes. Uh, I like everyone involved's work, so sure. <laughs> and I have, uh, as I said, Kevin was personally very nice to me. I've never met Ian, um, but he's kind of been nice adjacent uh, to the website I work for, and so I have nothing bad to say really about anyone except. It's it is uh, you can say. Uh, Kevin Kelly has bad political views mm -hmm. and Kevin Kelly has buried uh, has been unprofessional and burying burying Ian in the past. If what Ian said is true. And you can also say that Kevin Kelly was definitely his career was definitely harmed by Ian going public with these things. It was also harmed by Kevin <laughs> being being bad on the first three collision shows he did or sure. what have you. But it was but he has also definitely been harmed by Ian burying him on uh, what should have been a private server, but there's no such thing. So there are layers, there are layers to this. Everyone has a point. Um, I don't know what to say other than that it's the, probably the end of Kevin Kelly and AEW. And I don't know where he goes now because he's burned uh, the New Japan Bridge. Um, maybe he becomes the voice of uh, Pro Wrestling Noah. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought maybe NWA or uh, or MLW. Um, could be. Uh, it seemed like he was angling for Noah for a while there, though, which I don't know how that would work because their guy... They have a guy, Mark Pickering, that does their stuff, and uh, he's an exceptional weirdo. So I don't Is he know. He's the about one that. that tried to shame Eddie Kingston about wearing the Four Pillars shirt. Probably so. And yeah. then it turns out he was selling bootleg Four Pillars merch. Yeah, classics. That guy. That guy's exceptionally weird. Cool. <laughs> I. I. A I, bunch I... of normal men. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um... Any thoughts on the uh, Kevin Kelly? Yeah, like like I said, it's it. My heart is not going to be in defending the fifty five year old right wing guy who's telling people to go watch Sound of Freedom. All right, like so, it's hard for me to get my you know to really get my dander up about that. That being said, you could argue, Ian, whether or not it wasn't totally public, he didn't. Ian Riccoboni didn't tweet out. Kevin Kelly has been bad mouthing me to anyone that would listen for 10 years. He didn't tweet that out. He said it on a, a, a like you said, a private discord server, but obviously he knew people were going to see it. If he's not a complete idiot, he probably knew there's at least a decent chance. This is going to end up 
spreading beyond this Discord server. So on one hand, if Ian was not disciplined for airing his dirty laundry, <laughs> yeah, and then Kevin was, that does seem like a little bit of a double standard. You could argue that Kevin went further, as you said, saying that he was considering maybe once he starts threatening to get lawyers involved, that's <laughs> maybe that's the point of difference from the company side of it. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't know. Uh, like I said, it's I I think it feels like just a public argument <laughs> where neither guy is addressing the other one directly. Yes, and and now one guy is losing his job because whether fair or not, he is significantly less well liked <laughs> and is considered to do a much uh, less good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and therefore Ian is going to stay being in the voice of Ring of Honor and stay being pretty well liked in that company and it looks like Kevin is gone and I'm not saying that's completely fair <laughs> but that does seem to be the thing like I said it's it's hard for me to feel sorry for for anybody here but like I said I also won't say that my personal distaste for the man's personal beliefs says that i didn't like i I just said it like i i even now i kind of still enjoy kevin kelly on commentary even though everything everyone says about his commentary since he's come to aw is true (laughs) i like i said there's some kind of comfort to it and he does and i think the argument can be made well he didn't have like the cachet built up that tony and jr who also maybe didn't know everything (laughs) Sure. When they got to AEW, um, but didn't have he's not an he's not considered to American fans at least he's not considered an all time great legendary announcer you know fixture of the business like those two guys are. So he probably had a shorter leash. And then if you add in that you know he had a personal issue with another announcer who is well liked by a lot of people. Yeah, that's a recipe for a short. <laughs> A short AEW career, and um, I guess I would I would hope that he just finds finds uh, hopefully can find another gig in wrestling. Like I said, I still do enjoy him. Um, my fear would be that he is gonna start a YouTube channel and start <laughs> leaning into those uh, problematic beliefs of his. Because that has been proven to be a pretty successful grift over the last couple of years. If you're uh, if you're uh, fi- no longer able to be financially successful in your industry, to claim that the reason you aren't is because you are right wing, that is a pretty uh, that has a proven track record of success as far as making people a lot of money. So uh, I hope Kevin doesn't go down that particular road, but it's certainly there and he could certainly also try to swerve into the you know the podcast lane and be another guy uh yelling into a mic about uh about aw every week that's also proven to be a pretty successful uh, career path to a certain extent all right we've covered a lot anything else you want to get into no, I think that's uh, I think that's about it. Hopefully, uh, this I think we're doing a, we're doing a face to face on SmackDown. Rock's here every week. Oh, do want to congratulate Rock on his new men's health brand. Uh, he was working uh, hand in hand with the scientists. He was in the lab, wearing a lab coat, wearing his little glasses, and 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 testing testing all the products. You know, mixing the chemicals himself. So. Any any products from the from the Rock's new uh, men's health brand, I'm sure are they've got the DJ scientific seal of approval, so you know you're really getting something special. Uh, Dwayne has pointed out that um, he's an advocate for wellness, mm. grooming, and men taking better care of ourselves. So, and that uh, also brings up that while we may not always talk about it us guys all want to look better and feel better too. Mm. And now with his new uh, skincare line of products here, um, everything will be available on Target beginning uh, this Sunday. And and 
you know, I hope the lines aren't too long because I, I think we all want to, we all want to get in there and, and take a look at the, the wonderful products that, uh, the wonderful men's health products that, uh, that Dwayne, Dwayne and the other boys in the lab have, uh, have whipped up for us. So the, uh, the brand is called Papa Tui. I haven't watched the video, so I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think I'm right. Um, let's see. It looks like we have a hydrating facial cleanser, a rejuvenating facial toner. We have a restoring daily facial moisturizer. We have an awakening eye gel. Um, I've used uh, an awakening eye gel before, by the way. Um, <laughs> please, no further questions. Uh, <laughs> there's a take yeah um let's see what else do we have here that's uh that's for those are the face the face products uh body and hair we have a refreshing body wash comes in one two three different uh scents we have a nourishing shampoo and conditioner that comes in three different scents we have three different bar soaps, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different deodorants, uh, a body lotion. Yeah, so you're getting you're getting the drift here. And uh, there's a thing for tattoo care. What is that? There's an enhancing tattoo stick and an enhancing tattoo balm. Wow, all of these great products will be available at Target this Saturday or Sunday, rather this Sunday. Oh, Papa two. Papatui wouldn't want any of our listeners to be embarrassed by showing up, uh, you know, one day early to get in line for the for the Papatui products. Well, they may want to get there early anyway. That's true. The lines will be so long. Absolutely. That's I didn't think about that, but you're right. This could be a this, you know this could be a real Black Friday type situation. There could be a run on the stores. So me misspeaking may have actually helped the listener. <laughs> All right, good times. Till next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
there's always a moment where, <laughs> where yeah, he just keeps talking about his plums and the hue and <laughs> they have a lightish blue hue to them. <laughs> The oh. light bounces off of him. Just nice. I'm going to take him down to the farmer's market. <laughs> so I'm going to sell him two plums for one. <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where, like, because people always point to, like, the second anchor man is like, okay, this is when that formula went too far. <laughs> and it was clearly just a bunch of guys, like, dicking around on set. And it's not a great movie. Like, right. Right. And that might be true. Yeah. But the formula has been a proven success. So like that <laughs> one, the bit where he and uh and uh John C. Riley in Talladega Nights are doing their PSAs <laughs> about wild <Yeah>. vicious dogs <laughs> yes. that are controlling most of the major cities <laughs> in America. Like, yeah, it's just like, all right, I'm sorry. It's all worth it. He can make <laughs> as many bad movies as he wants, as long as they're also as long as the cameras are rolling uh, while, while he's just dicking around and we get some kind of gag reel out of it. Because right. <laughs> there's going to be gold in there somewhere. I'd like to talk to you about night blindness and cats. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on. 